a little bit loud. Sorry. All right. So thankful to be here again. It's, it's nice to kind of get in the routine of things. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of the faces that I, I've seen before. Hopefully, I can get to know your name, get to know who you are. And, and I'm sorry if I keep asking, like, what your name is. Uh, I'm, I'm really trying. I'm, I'm going through my head, everyone's name. So I would love uh, not only to get to know your name, but I would love to meet up with you during the week. If you're interested and uh, you, you have a need or, or you want to just talk, if you have a prayer request, anything, uh, feel free to call, to email me and all these things. I know in the future, it'll be in the, it'll be in, in the announcements, like my email, my personal information. Don't feel, uh, feel free to call me whenever. Feel free to email me whenever. I'm available for you at all times of the day, uh, all times of the week. So, yeah, and this goes for the youth kids as well. If you guys need someone to talk to you about something, I'm here to pray for you. I'm here to talk to you, uh, whatever you need. So, me being your, your pastor, your regular pastor, you're going to hear a lot of stories, and I hope not to repeat myself in a lot of ways, uh, but what I'm going through right now in my life, being a, a young father, I realize a lot of even when I prepare my sermons, a lot of the things I think about is my relationship with my daughter. I, I think about how I interact with her and, and how I talk with her and to her and how she's learning and she's growing, and I realize there's an amazing thing that's, that's happening each and every day is I'm, I'm learning a little bit of God's heart. Not, not God's whole heart. I, I'm, not, I'm not God, and, and my daughter isn't, isn't that far be beneath me. But what I, what I realize when I learn every single day is um, the way that God looks at us and the way he treats us in comparison to the way that we look and treat God. Today's sermon is going to be, up, uh, it's going to be about perspective. And what I realized about having a young daughter, and she's turning two in November, but she's so smart, she's so bright, and, and she's so, oh, it's, it's so awesome to hear her talk and, and, and say all these words, and so I'm so excited. But what I realized is that children lack perspective. They, they, don't, they don't really see the big picture. And so with our daughter, with a lot of things that happen um, from it being food time, like time to eat, she, she's so focused on the food. She's fo so focused on eating. She's so focused on what she wants to eat that when she doesn't get what she wants, if it's, I mean, she loves carbs. She loves, she loves like rice. She loves noodles, uh, which she calls nunus. Uh, she loves candy. She loves, well, I mean, we try not to give her candy, but she loves candy. She loves chocolate. She loves sugar. She loves all these things. And, and so when she's focused, and that's her perspective, is she wants to eat, she wants to eat pop. You know, we, we, give her, we give her a vegetable, broccoli, we give her those, you know, even corn. She'll be like, no, pop. And, and, and when she wants noodles, she, she'll demand nunus. She's like, nunus. And when she wants a banana, she'll say, nana, nana, nana. You know, I want my nana now. And, and, and she'll throw a fit. Recently, what we're seeing with our daughter is, is more and more of um, desiring her parents. It's, it's really interesting. When uh, both of us are home, she's so happy. She's like, she's in her own world, enjoying life. And then uh, if my wife goes and, and gets groceries or, or goes somewhere by herself, and it's just me and my daughter, Emery's perspective is all of a sudden, is, is mama, 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 where's mama? And she cries so much, and she just never stops crying, just constantly screaming, constantly uh, desiring for her mom. And then when I'm gone, when I'm uh, at church, and, and this week especially when I was just in the office, Emery just cries, and she's just like, where's appa, 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 appa? And so we have to like kind of rem remind her, it's like, don't worry, Appa's going bye-bye, but he's going to come back. You know, he, he'll, he'll be back home. You know, Amma's just going to go and, and, and she'll be gone. And it's like, Appa's in the restroom. Like, he's not, he's not going far away. He, he's still home. And what I realized, my daughter, because she lacks perspective, every time she doesn't get what she wants, every time one of us is gone, she in her mind is like, my dad's dead. My, my mom abandoned us. She's gone forever. I didn't get my rice today. I'm going to starve. I'm going to die. And I realize, man, if she only knew our heart, if she knew our heart, we would feed her everything she would want. We would, we would be with her all the time. We would always, always be around her. But even as parents, our perspective, we understand, if we gave our daughter everything she wanted, she would become very spoiled. She would become this, this attitude where, where if she just says it and then her parents are like the servants who are rushing to, rushing to, to make sure that the, the baby has everything that they need. And so again, our perspective as parents is a little bit greater, and so we understand, no, Emery, no, no, it's not time yet. Let's, let's wait, wait. And so Emery will, will look at us and say, wait, 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 and she'll, she'll have that perspective. But what I'm learning even more is even as a parent, I lack perspective. There are things that happen, and I'm sure that if you have a family, even if you don't have a family, if you're married, if you're single, you realize there are times in your life where you get frustrated, you get angry, you get mad about certain things because you lack perspective. 
whether it's you losing a job, whether it's a family member getting sick, whether it's getting in a fight with a loved one, many times in our lives, bad things happen. And instead of us kind of taking a step back and saying, you know what, things are going to be okay. I have a father in heaven who loves me and who's going to take care of me, who's going to watch over me even during this hard time where I want the thing that I want. I want, I want the comforts of life. Dad, I trust you. But many times we lack that perspective that God is watching over us. He is protecting us. He's providing for us. That when we lose something that matters so much to us, it's like that toy that gets taken away from our hands and we say, huh? God, why, how, how dare you take that away from me? And we begin to cry and we be, begin to complain and say, I deserve that thing. I deserve that job. I deserve that, that, that boyfriend, that girlfriend. I deserve a happy life. I deserve a family. And we, and we become like a child. But we lack so much perspective that even when we characterize and categorize God, we think that God is, he's, we make him so small. Something I really want to teach you over, over however many Sundays I'm here, you know, I, I hope it's the rest of my life, I, however many Sundays, I want us to realize that every time we think about God, that we're only scratching the surface. That many times when we are in our situations, our troubles, and, and we are in our lives, our perspectives, that when we think of God, we, 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 we put him down to our level. We put him down to our level, and then we raise him up a little bit. We put him down to our level and say, God, this is what I'm seeing, and I know you're above it, and, and, and yet I need you to work. I need you to, to, to act and operate in a certain way. In reality, in reality, what really God is experiencing and God is thinking and God is going through, it's not bound by time. And this is something that I really want us to understand because I'm going to mention it through many of my sermons, is that God doesn't live in the present only. He lives in the past, present, and future. And that means when he looks at you, when he sees you, he doesn't just see you as you are right now. He sees you as you were in the past, as you were when you were a child, when you were a baby, as you were when you were in your mother's womb. He sees you that right now. And not only that, he sees you when you're old and gray. He sees you at the end of your life. And he lives with you in those things. And so when we realize that when God looks at the world, when he looks at his creation, he doesn't just see the present, he sees the past, present, and future all simultaneously we begin to realize his perspective, his outlook, is far greater. Today we're going over a story in Exodus. And it's found in Exodus chapter 32. And it's a story about the Israelites. After they've been saved from slavery in Egypt and brought into the wilderness where they were hungry and they were, they were kind of wandering around and God sent them manna from heaven. And he sent them these, these flakes. I, I can only imagine what they tasted like. Probably pretty bland, but uh, just imagine like, Instead of snow falling from the ground, that manna was falling from heaven. They would grab it, they would eat it, and it would be enough to, to sustain them. And he brought them in the wilderness, and now Moses has, been, has gone up to Mount Sinai, and he's gotten the Ten Commandments, he's gotten the laws, and while he's up there talking and communing with God, they're back in the valley. They're back at the base of the mountain, and they think that Moses has died. And rightly so. I, I think it's one of those stories where we, we, you don't give enough credit to the Israelites. They, they really think that because Moses has been on that mountain for so long, and they probably see this cloud of, of lightning and thunder and, and, just, and just being like, whoa, this is amazing. But Moses hasn't come down for quite some time, so he's probably dead. So what do we do now? So if you would open up your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 32. We're just going to read the, the first couple verses. Uh, but I would totally encourage you to read the rest of the chapter with your, with your families or just by yourself in your quiet times because it's such an amazing chapter that I believe just shows the heart of God. So we're going to re uh, read from verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off your rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hands and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel. 
who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. They rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We're going to stop there for now. The reason why this story is so amazing, and I'm going to take a little bit um, of a different perspective on this. Because usually when you hear this sermon, you focus so much on how could the Israelites have done that? Like, how, how could they have done that where they were saved from slavery, God led them out of Egypt, and he parted the Red Sea, he parted, he parted the waters that they were able to walk through, and God defeated the Egyptian army, and, and even when they were in the desert, God was able to provide the manna from heaven. How could the Israelites begin to worship this golden calf? And Before I answer that question, I really want us to think about the flip side from God's perspective. The way that God is looking at this situation. Many times the way we think of God is that God is living a linear, a, 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 a life of bound by time. And we think that God is the one who's saying, okay, I'm going to save them from Israel and then they're going to love me. And then I'm going to part the Red Sea and then they're going to love me. I'm going to give them manna from heaven and then they're going to love me. And so when they build this golden calf, it's, oh my goodness, how could they not love me? But the problem with that perspective is that, again, it bounds God in time. It puts God on our perspective, our level, and says that, God, you're just as surprised as I am. You know, how, how dare these Israelites build this golden calf? What I want us to realize today is that from God's perspective, before he even decided to make the Israelites, before he even decided to save the Israelites and bring them out of Egypt and lead them through all these miracles, God had already predestined. He had already known in his mind, I'm going to save them. I'm going to rescue these people. And so as we look back, it's almost a question of, God, but why? Don't you know that in the future they're going to create a golden calf and they're going to give credit to the golden calf? Yeah, I know. I, I know that they're going to build this idol. I know they're going to worship this idol instead of me, and yet I still will save them. If I was God, if I was in God's position, and I knew that if I save someone, and I, I really rescued them from a terrible situation, and they weren't going to give me the credit. They weren't going to, to say thank you. They weren't going to, to really just say, I'm so glad that you rescued me. I would probably think to myself, if I knew that they would be ungrateful, I would say, you know what? Leave them in slavery. Let's leave them in Egypt. Because I know when, when we go out into the desert, and even if I feed them, provide them water, keep them alive, even if I fashion for them a, a promised land, a land that I'm dedicating to them, they're not going to give me thanks. They're not going to give me the glory. So why bother? But see, our God is so good. Our God is so loving that even though he knew that they would rebel, even though he knew that they would sin, that they would create this golden calf and honor and worship it, he still saved them. He still rescued them. And I think the progression of the way that he interacts with them in the rest of the chapter is not to kill them, but it's to discipline and train them and show them that truly this golden calf isn't what saved them, but an active and living God, a true king, is who saved them. God's intention for your life is not to punish, is not to destroy, is not to hurt you, Many times we begin to think this way because we think in our heads, I sinned and therefore that's why I'm going through all these troubles. I've sinned and I've gone through, gone through all these things. The, the answer is, say yes, your sin is deserving of judgment. Your sin is deserving of wrath, of all this, this punishment. But because we know God's heart, that he sent Jesus to die in our place, if we really believe that Jesus took our place on the cross, if Jesus is the one who bore our sins, when we go through these trials and tribulations, it's not because God is trying to kill you. It's not because God is trying to, is trying to make sure that your life is a living hell, but instead, we have to realize and understand that God is using those trials and tribulations to turn us back to him. Because what ends up happening is many times we end up doing the same thing the Israelites are doing. We build up for ourselves golden calves, idols in our lives. 
And honestly, I think in our day and age, the idols are pretty simple. They're, they're not these complex things. The idols of, of the, the, modern, the modern capitalistic Western life is comfort. In many ways, all of our actions, all of the things we do, and this includes inside the church, is to build up for ourselves a place of comfort. And we begin to say, oh, it's this comfort that saves me. It's this comfort that brings me joy. It's this comfort that I will put my prized possessions into so that I can gain more comfort. We look at our families, and we hope for our children that they would be able to be intelligent and smart, but we pray and we hope that they would be comfortable, that they would get a good job so that they would make enough money, so that they would be comfortable. The Israelites, with their golden calf, they had these, this, this gold jewelry, these earrings, these necklaces, these, these rings. And the amazing thing is, is when you read in Exodus chapter 12, and I would totally recommend you going back and reading Exodus chapter 12, and what it says is, is that God is the one who gave them this gold jewelry. God is the one that, that blessed them so much that, the, that when they were about to leave Egypt, that the Egyptians were like, here, take, take this gold jewelry. That God gave them favor. And so really the gold jewelry, the nice things that the Egyptians had was from God. God blessed them. But what did the Israelites do with their blessing? They made for them, they fashioned for themselves their own God. A God that they could control. A God that they could build up. A God that they could understand the perspective. They could understand what he was doing because truly they were the ones in control. It's amazing what even Aaron does after he does this. After the Israelites build up this golden calf, after they melted all of their golden jewelry, all of their nice things, and they build up this golden calf, Aaron says, tomorrow? We're, we're definitely going to give thanks to this golden calf for bringing us out of Egypt, but tomorrow we're going to have a feast for Yahweh. We're going to have a feast for the Lord. And so Aaron is probably one of those church guys who, who, sees, who sees all of his friends building up these idols, who even helps them build up their idols, and that they can worship the idols, that they pour all their resources, all their time, all their energy. And he says, well, I think we need to have service. I, I, think, I think we need to make sure that we go to church every, each and every Sunday. And, and, and you know what? During the six days of the week, go ahead and, and, and worship and glorify your God of comfort. Go ahead. It's great. I'll help you. you know, I'll help you build up you know, your portfolio. I'll help you make sure that you have all the right finances. I'll, I'll make sure that your kids go to the right college. But on Sundays, can you guys just come and, and we're going to give thanks to Yahweh. We're going to give thanks to God. The, the issue is this. We all know we build up our own idols. I, I don't have to stand up here and explain to you. It's so bad, you build up your idols, destroy your idols, get rid of your idols, throw them away. Because what I know is that it's a part of human nature. It happens naturally. Building up these idols happen naturally. What, what happens to the Israelites is that their strong leader, their Moses, was gone for a while. And so they didn't have someone to really focus on to lead them through the tough times. They were, they were there by themselves. And so they naturally wanted someone to follow, wanted something to, to dedicate their life to. That's how we're wired as people, is we want to dedicate our life to something, to a cause, a purpose. And many of us in this room are dedicating our lives around finding comfort, finding that joy from that comfort. And so it's a natural thing. So I'm not here telling you, you need to destroy all your idols. I, I want to share with you that the reason why you have these idols in your life is because of a lack of perspective. See, what the Israelites weren't doing, what they should have done, as Moses was on the mountain, they should have been talking to one another. Hey, do you remember when we were in Egypt? Do you remember that, that slave master that was over us that didn't even provide the, the, the straw to, so we could make these bricks? Do you remember how, how bad that guy was and, and how terrible he was? Man, thank God that he brought us up out of that. They weren't talking to one another explaining, hey, kids, do you remember when God split the Red Sea? Did you know that, that God is so powerful and so strong that he was able to, to part the seas and defeat our enemies for us? The Israelites weren't telling their testimonies to one another. They weren't saying what God had done in the past. They were so focused on what God was doing in the present, right now. If only they were talking to one another and saying, hey, 
you remember when God sent manna from heaven? Do you remember when food literally fell from the sky and he, he provided for us? Do you remember where we were in the past and how God has led us here? Their idolatry, idolatry was caused because they were being so short-sighted. If only they had remembered. If only they had remembered what God had done in the past. Then the idea of a golden calf would have been ridiculous to them. Why would I build up a golden calf? Why would I melt my nice things? There's a living God. There's a God who loves me, who cares about me, who, who desires good for me, who wants me to prosper, who wants me to experience life to the fullest, who wants me to obey and follow him. Why would I get rid of my jewelry to build up a golden calf? God is the one who gave me this jewelry. God is the one who gave me favor for these nice things. And so, church, what I want to explain to you, and I, I'm sure you've heard it many times, is that the way to, to stop the idols in your life is to destroy them, get rid of them. You know, you drive a nice car, you know, sell your car and, and drive a beater car. You know, you live in a nice neighborhood, sell that house and go live in the ghetto. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that when God is walking with you, when God is leading you in your life, are you giving him thanks? Are you telling people about what God is doing in your life? Or are you keeping silent? Are you becoming very short-sighted? Today, what I really want to encourage you is the way that we attack the idols in our lives. The way that we get rid of these idols, the ones that we've propped up and we've melted our nice things to build up to make sure that we have this comfort in our lives, to have this great life, this joyous life. The way that we battle that is that from our mouths, from our mouths comes words of thankfulness to the living God. Is that when we begin to share our testimony about what God has done in my life, has, what God has done in your life, what God is currently doing, what God has done, what we pray that God would do, the church becomes alive. The church becomes excited. Instead of us having this congregation and building up idols and saying, okay, you know what, you guys, make sure that you have comfortable lives and good families, and, and, and that is what life is all about. I'm here to tell you today, that is not the God I serve. I don't serve the God of comfort. I don't serve the God of money. I don't serve the God of success. I serve a God who loves us so much that even though he knew we would build up these idols, even though he knew we would be selfish in this way, he still sent his son to die for us. Us. He still sent Jesus to be the payment for our sins. So regardless of how much you mess up, regardless of how bad you are, God's perspective, he knows even the crazy stuff you're going to do in the future. He knows everything you've done in the past. He knows what sin you're in right now. He looks you square in the eye and says, I love you and I'll take the, the burden of your sin. I'll take the penalty of your sin. And it's from that. It's from that that our testimony arises. I have a God who loves me no matter what. And so then what happens? Then what ends up happening is very similar to what the Israelites did. Is that we melt our golden jewelry. We, we have our nice things. And instead of building an altar for a fake God, we say, Lord, you gave me everything. You gave me this jewelry. You're the one who, who put us here. This is all for you. Everything I own, everything I am is for you. I want to follow you the rest of my days. And the amazing thing is this, is that God takes that worship and he says, child, I'm leading to a place even better than this. I'm leading you to the promised land. A land that flows with milk and honey. A land where, yeah, your earrings and your, your necklace, they're great and all, but we're, I'm going to take you to a place where, where all your needs are covered. You have no need for those idols. I'll take care of you. Church, I want us to be thankful. I want us to share what God is doing. Don't be afraid of sharing your testimony of what God is doing. If we really want to go to the promised land, if we want to go to that place where God is taking us, that he's already prepared for us, that it's that place that it's a part of our destiny. 
what's going to hinder us, what's going to leave us in the desert, what's going to lead us thirsty and hungry is if we continue to prop up our idols. And I'm not here to say to sell everything you have. What I'm here to say is, are you remembering what God has done in your life? As your pastor, I, I, I hope and I pray that I have time to hear every single one of your testimonies. I hope that God is, because I know he's living and active and he, what he's doing is so amazing, that I hope and pray that some of you would come up to me and say, Pastor, I want to share my testimony to the church. Not so that you can get the glory, but so that God can get the glory. And I know and I know and I know that if you share your testimony, it may destroy the idol of someone's life. It may destroy them from putting all of their hope and resources in the things of this earth, and instead it would turn their hope and their resources into a living God. And again, this even goes for the young ones. This goes for you guys too. I I can't wait for the day that my daughter tells me her testimony. And so I know your parents would love to hear your testimony. They would love to hear what God is doing in your life. And it doesn't have to be anything big. When I was a kid, I thought, because I was pretty... um, pretty obedient. I I wasn't like the rebel. And so I thought, in order for me to be a really good Christian, I need to get into drugs and alcohol and and, and do all these bad things so that God can save me. And then I can say, oh yeah, I was in all these bad things. Now I'm in these good things. But that's actually not, that's not from the Bible. That's not, that's not how it works. God is going to change you as you are right now. He's going to lead you in your life right now. And as he raises you up, do you have the courage? Do you have the desire to share that story? Church, I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. And we're going to spend some time in prayer. Just going before God, and, and it's, it's a simple prayer. And I want to lead us in it. It's just saying thank you. It's saying thank you to God for, for what he's done in your life, what he's doing in your life. And I want us to think of it like this. You're a child who's saying thank you to your father. A child who's saying thank you to your parents. Saying, Lord, thank you. I may not be comfortable right now. I may, not, I may not have everything I want. I may not have everything I desire, but I'm so thankful for what, you're, what you've done in my life. I'm so thankful for what you're doing, and I trust that you will take care of me. You will watch over me. As you're praying for that, also be praying for our church. Many times, uh, churches just go through these times of being in the desert, and these are the times where many, many, many congregations cling on to idols because they're afraid of being in the desert. They're afraid of being in those dry places. And so instead of really trusting and relying on a God who loves them, a God who brought them into this place, they put all of their resource, their time, their energy into fake gods. Let's pray that our church would remember who God is, would remember what Jesus did on the cross, remember that our Savior lives, that the Holy Spirit resides with us. Let's pray. to you today humbled. God, we know that many times our perspective is so limited. We we get so frustrated when things don't go our way. And and, and God, we've made for ourselves so many idols, so many things that we worship, we put all of our time and energy into. And God, I pray that you would turn our focus onto you. God, that we would give you thanks for all the things in our lives. God, we would give you the glory for everything that you've done. That we would know and tell the world how amazing our Father in heaven is. Father, I pray for this church. I pray that this church would be known as a church that shares testimony. Testimony of what you've done, about how you have acted and how you are are active and living in our lives. God, we need you. We need your perspective. Father, I pray that, that we wouldn't be a church that simply allows idolatry to run rampant. That we would not be a church that just says, okay, let's just tack on a service and and then you can go and and live a life of the world. Father, I pray that this church would be living and active in your spirit. Lord Jesus, help us to remember the cross, the payment that you made, that even while we were still sinners, you sent your son to die for us, a brutal and painful death. God, and he was innocent like a lamb. And God, that he accepted that punishment without any complaint because he loves us, because you love us. Father, I pray that as we experience 
your word, as we experience your mighty hand in our lives, would you give us hearts of thanks? Would you wash away our indifference? Would you wash away our selfishness and point us to the cross? We love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you those chains? That starting today, that instead of singing songs of lament about how we are stuck in that bondage, I pray that we would sing.